So I'd like to introduce our esteemed speakers this afternoon. We have Henry Zakumumpa from Uganda. You could wave. So Henry is a PhD fellow at Makerere University School of Public Health with over 15 years experience of HIV with the CSO sector in Uganda. We have Irina Kovalchuk from the Ukraine, who is an advocacy professional with seven years of experience in social care services for PHIV in Ukraine and has a deep knowledge of budget advocacy and spending control, local policy formulation, programs, implementation. Then we have Ivan Varenstov from Lithuania, who is working with the Eurasian Harm Reduction Association as a sustainability and advocacy advisor since 2017, and he graduated with an MS in public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and has been working in the area of HIV prevention in the EECA region since 2004, and we've got Rifat Rachman from Thailand, who is a Rax Thai research affiliate. We have Ralph Jorgens from Switzerland, who is a senior coordinator human rights at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And before he joined the Global Fund, was the director of programs at OSF's public health program, co-founder and executive director of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network. And then we have Elena Shastina from the Russian Federation, um, who is engaged in implementation of uh, services for prevention, care support, and treatment of HIV for 11 years. So you, as you can see, our speakers are very well experienced in the area of, of discussion today. So I'd like to invite um, each of the speakers to go up, starting with Henry, to take us through his session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Henry Zakmumpa, as I introduce myself. Uh, the title of my presentation today is How Loss of PIPFA Support for Outreach Puts the 1990 Targets at Risk, Results from a Mixed Methods Evaluation in Kenya and Uganda. Uh, this research is led by Johns Hopkins University in the United States, and Makere University was the in-country partner in Uganda, and Ipsos Kenya was the partner in Kenya. Background. So in 2015, uh, PEPFA implemented a new strategy known as geographic prioritization. Uh, instead of a countrywide generalized approach to national HIV pre uh, responses in the countries it's supporting, uh, it sought to target uh, geographic subregions with relatively high HIV burden. So what happened is that it implemented uh, three investment categories. So there was the uh, areas in the countries of supporting called priority areas, which had a relatively high HIV burden, and it sought to intensify support in those areas. And then in the maintenance areas, or counties or districts, uh, these ones maintained more or less the same level of support. And then in the central support uh, counties or districts, uh, these were, based on data, uh, determined to have a relatively low HIV burden. So they were meant to transition to national government support in both Kenya and Uganda. So there is a gap in evidence on how facilities have coped with loss of support, and if government or other donors have filled the gap. Uh, this, of course, is important because outreach services are often donor-funded and cater to marginalized groups. Objectives. So uh, this study was commissioned by USAID, and it aimed to better understand uh, the, the implications of implementing this strategy uh, on HIV service delivery, non-HIV service delivery, but also on health systems in general. But uh, for to this afternoon's attention, we're going to try and look at uh, share emerging findings about how facilities and patients cope with loss of outreach uh, in the context of geographic prioritization in Kenya and Uganda. Now, as a map of Kenya, it tries to show you how the three investment categories uh, were applied in Kenya, and the red areas refer to the seven, I mean, the seven counties in Kenya uh, which were transitioned to Kenya national government support. And the second map, again, in the north, in the red districts, uh, refer to the 10, 10 districts in Uganda which were meant to transition to government of Uganda support. And uh, maybe something I should mention here is that in Uganda, beside the 10 districts also, 700, more than 700 health facilities also uh, were lost for support because they were deemed, again, based on data to have uh, low patient volume. So as I mentioned earlier, this, uh, the results we're presenting today are derived from a broader study. And, uh, but for these particular findings, or the, what I'm presenting today, we derived these studies, for, uh, these findings from a cross-sectional survey. Uh, we enrolled 230 facilities in Kenya and 262 facilities in Uganda in, an, in, a, in a survey to try and understand the differences uh, between maintenance and central support facilities uh, before geographic participation was implemented and, and after. 
but uh, we are looking at various parameters, HIV service delivery, and community outreach really was only one of them. Uh, but uh, most of, all, of the data I'm going to present this afternoon is derived from the qualitative case studies. So the qualitative component is very dominant in what I'm going to present. And we conducted the case studies of about five health facilities, both in Kenya and Uganda, in those areas which were affected by lots of support, uh, to try and understand, uh, uh, to try and compare uh, regarding outreach across uh, countries between maintenance facilities and uh, cross facility levels. So uh, these case studies are relied on in-depth interviews with ART clinic managers and facility in charges, as well as implementing partners in those districts or counties which were affected by transition. Uh, we also talked, we also conducted focus group discussions with patients attending all those facilities. Results. Uh, overall, there was lots of outreach services in both Kenya and Uganda. In Uganda, Central support facilities significantly more, were more likely to lose outreach support than maintenance. And if you look at the table below there, you see that uh, in Uganda, 52% of central support facilities reported uh, loss of outreach uh, activities uh, compared to 4% uh, in maintenance. But in Kenya, uh, there were similar rates uh, of loss of, uh, of community outreach activities across both central support and maintenance sites. So we are trying to understand now what does this mean for uh, the three nineties. So with regard to the first ninety, respondents in both Kenya and Uganda expressed concern about loss of community-based outreach for HIV testing. So uh, what happened is that during the time when PEPFA funding was still uh, forthcoming, uh, PEPFA was funding outreaches in the communities where they would do these huge demand creation uh, campaigns in the communities, in the villages, in households to kind of uh, get people to test for HIV. Uh, and uh, they would support uh, facility staff and also people called community linkage facilitators who are actually uh, expert clients uh, to go out there and try and get people to test for HIV. So when this funding was lost, all that ceased. So what we see is people were complaining that uh, HIV testing rates had actually gone down. And you can see those quotes to try and uh, what they're trying to illustrate is that a uh, sense that uh, HIV testing had gone down. But also, uh, uh, during the community outreach activities we were supported by PEPFA, uh, there used to be uh, campaigns targeting most at-risk population, such as uh, fisher folk, uh, motorcycle, taxi operators in Uganda, and sex workers. Now, all that ceased uh, after the end of support. And in Kenya, there's a huge problem of stigma in the communities. So uh, these outreaches used to help in, in, in ameliorating this stigma. But... When this funding ended, then uh, testing was affected and stigma became a real barrier to uh, testing. So in terms of uh, uh, ART enrollments and adherence, again, there was a common concern across both Uganda and Kenya that patients were defaulting on treatment. Uh, and this was across all the majority of the health facilities, which were the, uh, the majority of case study facilities. So uh, because the, community, the, the health facilities lost that community outreach arm, they were no longer able to uh, do patient follow-up in the communities. So uh, adherence became a problem. And uh, so you can see these quotes trying to bring out what that meant. So adherence became a problem. Uh, the, 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 the patients were no longer adhering to treatment. Uh, and uh, because of loss of these uh, 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 adherence support mechanisms, uh, which were supported uh, through the community. So adherence became a problem, and uh, that leads us to the third 90. Uh, now, uh, viral suppression. Uh, the, there was a key concern in both Kenya and Uganda that patients were defaulting on treatment, because if you're not adhering, then you get into a problem of viral suppression. Uh, we even got evidence of some patients which, uh, which were of claims that some of their colleagues were actually dying of, uh, which we didn't verify, but they claimed that some of their patients, I mean, their colleagues were dying uh, because they were no longer being supported to adhere. We are told when the patients become well, they stop taking drugs. And this community outreach arm used to ensure that patients adhere to treatment. So uh, we didn't get so many quotes around viral suppression, but there's a quote down there which tries to show you how viral suppression became a challenge. So viral load will sit higher, and I think that explains why their suppression rates are low because of the exit of some of those services. But we need, we, we need to acknowledge some uh, study limitations. Uh, outreach was not the focus, the primary focus of this study, uh, but was a really it emerged strongly in our results. So we thought this was compelling and uh, should, should, should be disseminated uh, uh, widely. So there were uh, also uh, other ongoing events in Kenya and Uganda. In Kenya, there was a long-term strike of doctors and nurses. 
And in Uganda, there was an ongoing process called uh, uh, rationalization. So it was not easy to, uh, to untangle all those factors to really say this is caused by GP and this is not caused by GP. So, uh, but, uh, and the findings, as you notice, are mainly uh, qualitative in nature. So we recommend further research that's more quantitative. So in conclusion, and this is my final slide, Mr. Chairman, uh, loss of PEPFAR support for outreach without government replacement may be hindering efforts across the treatment cascade. And without filling the gaps in support for outreach, and I should mention that both Kenya and Uganda governments have not stepped in to fill the gap left by PEPFAR. So without uh, this uh, outreach being, re I mean, revived, uh, killings between facilities and communities uh, could be lost, so potentially com compromising the country's 1990 goals. And we recommend further research, which is more targeted. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Henry, um, for the presentation and for highlighting the importance of community activities and community outreach. Let me now ask Irina to come up and tell us how the Ukraine is transitioning to sustainable funding of social care services for PLHIV. Just a few minutes for my presentation. Okay. Uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, thank you for the possibility to make the presentation on such important topic regarding search of alternative sources to financing of social care services. My case describes situation in Ukraine, but I hope many of you find something important for you, find, uh, see new possibilities for your communities as well. At first, at first background, I would like briefly to describe situation in Ukraine uh, with HIV epidemic. Uh, Ukraine is a middle income country and is, as you see, uh, there are a lot of people who require social care. There are many NGOs and programs running through Ukraine nowadays to fight HIV epidemic, but most of them are funded by Global Fund. It's more or less easy to run activities when you have support from international donors and other countries, but it can last forever. So you must change, find new ways to continue financing of activities. As you can see at this slide, um, dependence from the GF funding in Ukraine was pretty high in previous years. And starting from 28, the GF funding will drastically decrease. Ukrainian government had already supported life savings care, such as health care, IRT purchasing, or ST purchasing, but the rest of the services were funded by external donors. So we, the Ukrainian NGOs, had to find a solution how to cover the deficit of funds and continue to provide social care services without the impact on quality and quantity. For more, I had to, it had to be done based on Ukrainian internal funds national and regional budget in condition in on ongoing war with Russia. In uh, 2017, the Ukrainian network of people living with HIV, my organization and our uh, local NGOs started to look for alternative sources of financing. Uh, two potential sources have been defined, national and regional state budgets in Ukraine. We have started pilot projects on regional level so that regional success stories can be implemented on national level later on. The network and our local uh, NGOs has designed a set of interventions at regional level with primary and secondary activities. Primary activities were aimed on development of regional policies, then obtaining funds from local budgets, and uh, finally introduction of mechanism of direct purchase of social care services from NGOs. Sometimes secondary activities allowed to decrease cost of such services. And the second one, um, yeah. As a result of interventions, 21 regional authorities have already adopted policies regarding financial of social care services and started to allocate funds in regional budgets to direct purchase from NGOs in Ukraine. The rest of the regions are in process of adaptation or at final negotiation stage on that policies. Regional funding is beneficiary for all parties, since funding is done based on local priorities of communities and NGO can adjust their services according to those needs. This is a win-win situation for, for all, for our patients, for our NGOs, for local authorities and for donors too. 
Buyers of such services can be a wide variety of regional state health and social care institutions. It is important to mention that uh, those institutions already had experience of cooperation with NGOs and using their services funded by GF, Global Fund. This means that those institutions have positive experience and are willing to continue receiving services from NGOs, even if they must pay for themselves. I would like to show you my best, my, uh, my favorite, my favorite, an example of just one region with 300 people living with HIV. Um, till 2017, funding was provided only by Jeff in that region. Despite this, starting from 2017, the network, the local network in that region, was able to receive funds from regional budget on social care services. And in the first half of this year, such funding has already exceeded previous year. One more buyer started to purchase services and quality of coverage improved as well. Financial results of advocacy activities show that proactive role of NGO can ensure sustainability of vital social care services for people living with HIV and implement the plan of transition from donor funding to domestic regional funding. In uh, last year, after new regional policies introduction, regions allocated funding in amount of like 60,000 in total region budget to purchase of social care services. This year, our oh, own, oh, and that year, additionally, almost 1,000 people get social care services funded from regional budgets. Yes, and this year, four more, almost, uh, we expect to see $2,000, $200,000, i sorry, I have a problem with the, these numbers, uh, but you can see them all in the slide, yeah. Uh, and they are planned to be allocated in first half of this year, as well as almost 3,000 people will get social care services. Also, secondary advocacy initiative allowed to, to save money on rental fees and other payments for NGOs annually. As a result, less funding will be needed or saved funds will be allocated directly for social care services. And we can cover more people with social care services. And in the end, I, I use my favorite quote, yeah, this Bucky Fuller quote. He said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model absolute. So our interven intervention made by my organization, by our local partners, they made the, a new model. Uh, which allowed creating environment for transition to sustainable funding and social care services for people living with HIV through regional budgets. Also, best practices are used by many NGOs in my country in other social care sector. Uh, and our final target is to cover 100% of regions of Ukraine and provide funds needed for social care services for people living with HIV from state and regional budgets. And I want to thank all of my colleagues and partners from region to contrib for contribution in this, um, in this great work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Irina. I really like that quote, to change something, build a new model. And thank you for highlighting the new model in the Ukraine. I think we have all learned a lot. Next is Ivan to take us through the development of impactful advocacy arguments for domestic investments in HIV response among key population. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so I would like to start my presentation with uh, giving you a brief overview of the transition status uh, of uh, countries in Eastern Europe and, and uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, my region. Uh, and uh, first of all, I need to say that there are no uh, low-income countries uh, in the region anymore since 2015, when the World Bank uh, reclassified uh, Tajikistan into the low- and middle-income countries for some reasons. Um, and uh, ECA region is like one of two regions in the world, uh, along with the LAC, Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, we are planning for transition and um, for transitioning away from the Global Fund is uh, most advanced. Uh, 
so as you may see on the slide, uh, we have uh, seven components in five countries which recently, uh, um, which implementation recently came to an end. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, they didn't receive any transition funding uh, because they became ineligible for the global fund support before uh, the introduction of the relevant policy. Uh, also, we have uh, three components in two countries uh, which received their last transition grants uh, within current allocation period, 2017-2019. Uh, uh, we have six components in three countries which are projected by the Global Fund to tr uh, transition uh, from uh, its support by 2025. Also, uh, according to the policies of the Global Fund, uh, Global Fund expects all upper um, uh, middle-income countries uh, with high disease burden to begin sustainability and transition planning uh, or to build upon existing planning uh, during the current allocation period. And uh, we have six such countries, upper middle-income countries uh, in the region with nine eligible uh, uh, components, which already started the transition processes. Uh, and pl uh, transition planning and uh, implementation of uh, transition plans. And actually we have only five uh, low and middle income countries in the region which might still have time for uh, long-term sustainability and transition planning. But actually almost all of these countries uh, also started transition uh, processes. Uh, so the issue of ensuring sufficient domestic investments uh, to sustain each of response is very much on the agenda of the civil society in most of the countries of the region. Um, in theory, it's supposed that like middle-income countries uh, should be capable enough to control HIV TB epidemics themselves and uh, should not like uh, uh, be dependent on the donor support uh, in their fight. But in practice, we know that it really did not so, and uh, it, it actually depends on the ne next key factors. And this is the concept proposed by OSF. Uh, first of all, if the country is ready for transition for, from donor support, and by readiness we mean like if uh, the country have all uh, relevant systems and legislation in place, uh, uh, if this uh, system and legislation properly work, and uh, uh, if the country is ready to take over funding for HIV prevention programs uh, itself. If the country is willing, and this could be a major challenge because like, the country can be ready, able, but not willing to uh, sustain some particular uh, components of HIV response, particularly targeted on key affected populations. And uh, of course, if the country is able, or uh, simply speaking, if the country has enough money like to um, uh, support HIV response and uh, um, step in uh, when donor uh, stopped f provide f funding. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, in East, uh, the region of Eastern Europe, Central Asia, most of countries uh, they are either, either not ready or not able or not willing to sustain HIV response among key affected populations. And that's why, that's why the advocacy is so important and uh, it's so important to have imp impactful arguments uh, like both for the government and for, the, for donors uh, um, for each case like to ensure the sustainability of services and to ensure the provision of uh, funding. Uh, so, uh, with my colleagues from uh, Eurasian Harm Reduction Association, we tried to analyze our experience and like, as well as the experience of some of our members and partners in the region uh, regarding what arguments are mostly uh, being used, do they work or not, being used in like uh, our advocacy towards governments to ensure the sustainability of HIV response among key affected populations. And uh, we came up, uh, came up with the next five like uh, arguments which have been mostly used in our work, uh, among others, are arguments. Uh, so let's go through them briefly. Uh, the first one like, is like the argument that access to HIV services for key population is a basic human right. Yeah. And in our opinion, like, it seems like this argument, at least in our region, and the, at least when being used like, alone, it's not really works because like, uh, in most uh, countries of Eastern Europe, Central Asia, the concept of human rights is still, still not uh, very popular among the governments. 
uh, of the region, maybe due to the Soviet Union background, and uh, also maybe the, due to the presence of still too many authoritarian regimes in the region. Uh, the second argument is about like that support of HIV prevention services for key affected relations is the state obligation, to, uh, which is based on its commitments to the citizens or to the donors. And this one could really work, but uh, from our experience, a strong watch dogging by the civil society groups is required uh, to constantly remind the government about their obligations and also the support from the external partners and donors um, is needed to make sure that the government takes such obligations and they keep to them. Um, the argument about like that uh, we civil society already calculated all unit costs and uh, estimated all existing gaps and drafted, uh, developed all uh, needed documents and please use them, take them and like we are happy to be involved with uh, this argument could could work of course uh, but unfortunately from our experience in fact like the governments they uh, they don't really often trust that the data being provided by NGOs or the method, methods being used by NGOs, especially as the, these NGOs are not like uh, uh, being considered by the government as like close partners um, or not being known well to the, to, to the government authorities. Uh, another uh, fourth argument is that the state will benefit in the long-term perspective with support um, prevention uh, now instead of paying for the treatment later. This could be a strong argument, but what we see is like not always NGO ha ha have a required data to support it. And the last uh, but not the least argument is that HIV prevention services for key population successfully works uh, in other countries and they're being supported by higher ranking officials and this like uh, argument uh, could be influential and could work, especially if the examples are given provided from the politically friendly neighboring countries uh, but uh, the problems here could be, first of all, with the rotation of the governmental officials and uh, also with the absence of the political will. Maybe we all, like many of you like within your organizations, did all these study tours for governmental officials to other countries and like... Um, after the study tours, like these officials became like the great supporters of uh, harm reduction, for example, and uh, your, uh, became your allies. But then the government is changing; these officials are being like replaced, and like uh, you need to start from scratch and working with the new ones. Or if there is absence of the political will, even if like uh, the exact officials are the supporters of your work, uh, they will not uh, do anything against like the general line. Uh, general policy and also in some countries in the region for example particularly in Russia there is a general negative attitude due to like kind of Western uh, practices and Western approach and the, um, just because they're coming from like uh, the West and like uh, um, because uh, such governments think that, that, that they have their own way uh, of doing things uh, so br just briefly a couple of examples um, uh, on the, based on the experience of our partners uh, uh, where this like advocacy ar arguments worked in practice. Uh, in Belarus, uh, uh, it was a major breakthrough in 2016 when provision of NGO-based HIV prevention services among key affected populations within the governmental support uh, was planned and budgeted within the governmental program on um, HIV prevention uh, for 2016-2020. And a special law regulating the social contracting and the sphere of HIV prevention among key affected populations was developed and uh, approved by the government and all re regulate, regulatory documents uh, were developed. And starting from this year, actually, this law and this social contracting mechanism is being piloted in country. And uh, this was achieved on one hand due to the fact that, like, the... Um, uh, development and introduction of the respective mechanism, social contract mechanism, was one of the key condition of uh, the Global Fund grant signed between the government and the Global Fund. And this grant was an par integral part of the framework agreement negotiated between the Global Fund and Belarusian government, which had uh, the status of the loss of the implementation of this social contract. And the introduction of the social contract was like kind of the obligatory for for the for the country. 
and also at the same time like uh, there was a particular NGO leading on the development of the social and cultural documents and uh, this NGO became the lead uh, and uh, actually developed all the package of the social contract documents for the mechanism so together by joint efforts of the global fund and civil society uh, like they managed to, to ensure that the government took uh, uh, the particular obligations and they keep to them uh, I'm kind, kind of like <laughs> out of time yeah uh, just very briefly another example from uh, the implementation of uh, eco cities project being implemented by the alliance for public health from ukraine uh, i will not the, read the slide you can see like what was the results and uh, how they uh, were, uh, were achieved so like um, by showing the experience of our other countries to the officials and the provision of uh, required data and calculations uh, being prepared by civil society and accepted by the government. And just briefly conclusions, so like more evidence-based data from the region is needed to support the advocacy. Uh, and uh, we need to really understand the budget processes and cycles and use the same methods and data collection which governments used so to be on the same page with them. Uh, the, there is a need for strong cooperation between civil society and the governments. And uh, actually more detailed and compre comprehensive analysis uh, of the advocacy arguments being used by civil society in the region and the impact uh, they have is needed. Thank you so much. Sorry for taking much more time. Thank you, Ivan, um, for highlighting key issues we must start to think about even as we think about transition, especially among key population and for highlighting the very interesting partnership in Belarus between government and NGO on social contracting. Um, Rifat, thank you. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, today I'll be discussing domestic financing policies to support CSOs working in HIV prevention in Thailand. I'll quickly preface, unfortunately, our lead speaker, Sunni Talawat, was unable to attend. So you have a, a, a very underqualified speaker in, in her place, but, but please bear with me. Um, so as, as a bit of context, um, in the early 2000s, Thailand established a policy that guaranteed universal health insurance for all of its citizens. And so people living with HIV are eligible to receive HIV treatment. But as this figure shows, there's still a considerable gap in ART coverage. Um, the epidemiology of HIV in Thailand has been shifting, um, becoming more concentrated in key populations, groups that have um, in many ways been driven to, to the margins of society, men who have sex with men, transgender women, people who inject drugs, and female sex workers. And it's in estimated that over 70% of new infections are, are occurring in these groups. One thing that um, for me personally has been uh, really heartwarming and inspiring has been to see how communities have really risen to take leadership in trying to combat this issue. So it is CSOs and key population networks who are the ones who, who go out to the bars, who go out late at night and make that extra effort to try and find those marginalized individuals and provide them with critical HIV prevention and testing services and make that vital linkage to the healthcare system for these people who are often forgotten. Um, and in fact, this work is very difficult for the traditional healthcare sector to perform. Uh, if, imagine if you are working on a, you know, a, a fixed hourly schedule. It's, it's quite challenging to be able to meet the, the needs of these uh, populations. Um, so this important and life-saving work has been primarily financed by international donors like the Global Fund and PEPFAR. But as we've been seeing from all of today's discussions, these donors are, are uh, slowly projected to be withdrawing their funding um, for these types of activities. So that leads us to the question, how can we sustain this essential work, work that is essential towards our common goal of ending AIDS, um, so I'll discuss some of the models that have been led by Thailand. So the National Health Security Office, NHSO, is Thailand's primary health financing agency. 
Um, it manages about a $90 million uh, dollar, uh, budget for HIV AIDS. Most of, most of that money goes to treatment and care. But in fact, there is a $6 million budget recently started that focuses on HIV prevention for key populations. So what does this budget aim to do? It aims to deliver a set of RRTTR services for key populations. So it aims to reach these hard to reach individuals, recruit them into HIV prevention services, get them tested, and if necessary, get them on treatment and retain them in the continuum of care. Now, one of the really interesting things is to think about how does a government agency like the NHSO go about implementing this type of program? And to understand that, we have to look at the, the legal mandate that drives the NHSO. So NHSO was kind of established to support hospitals primarily in delivering health services. So it is difficult for the NHSO to directly allocate money to CSOs. In fact, that's not part of their original legal mandate. So in the first year of this program, the money was allocated to hospitals, and hospitals then had the choice that they could either implement the HIV prevention programming themselves, or they could form a subcontract with a CSO. But in practice, it was very difficult for any community organizations to be able to participate in this fund throughout the first year. Um, and here is some of the national statistics on the performance of this uh, fund. So roughly 50% of the targeted key population individuals were successfully reached and recruited uh, into HIV prevention programs. So it reflects a significant unmet need. Now, in the second year of implementation, there was a, a, a robust advocacy process led by civil society to demand for greater participation into this uh, program. And following some legal reforms, the NHSO was allowed to directly allocate resources to CSOs, which was a big step forward. Um, and now, if you kind of imagine what, what is going on here, you have these two very divergent sectors in the government health financing as, and these uh, diverse civil society organizations that are, for in many senses, doing the, an unprecedented thing to form uh, relationships with one another and to see each other as partners um, in achieving the common goal. Uh, so kind of a schematic to summarize some of the discussions that occurred over the past year. So initially, a working group was formed between a network of CSOs, and that working group sought to kind of identify the on-the-ground problems that CSOs were experiencing as they sought access to this funding, as they tried to implement this programming. And then they would present uh, uh, the, their findings in an evidence-based manner to their government partners and collectively look for a, a resolution to these conflicts. Um, and here's some uh, preliminary data from the second year of implementation. You'll see that there is a marginal improvement in the overall performance of the fund. But what I really want to emphasize is that underlying these numbers, there has been significant development in the capacity of community institutions to directly engage and be seen as, as responsible partners to government in uh, working on the National AIDS Program. And some of the you know, observations from our community partners is that it was vital for the CSOs to be able to directly meet one-to-one uh, -one with NHSO officials. It was important to kind of clarify some of the legal questions I had described earlier. And actually an ongoing effort is to uh, form an accreditation system for CSOs to ensure and certify that they have the sufficient organizational capacity to successfully manage this fund and, and uh, implement this program. So, you know, to summarize, CSO staff are not just volunteers. They are doing life-saving work. They're doing work that's essential to our goal of ending AIDS. So to uh, successfully finance them, we may have to restructure some of the traditional health financing channels to, uh, to have greater inclusivity to community-based groups. And um, you know, as donors make their transition plans, it's important to have these uh, deliberate conversations. 
many people worked really hard, boots on the ground to, to do this work. Uh, a, a number of organizations are listed here. I want to specifically point out Denai from Rainbow Sky Association of Thailand is also leading a discussion on this topic. He's a real expert on this, as well as Dr. Kantinan, who is our partner at the NHSO. Um, so please, uh, if you're interested, uh, you know, check them out too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some very um, impressive things going on in Thailand and well articulated by a very able presenter, may I say. Thank you. Ralph? So good afternoon, everyone. My presentation is going to be quite different. All previous speakers talked about uh, how they address the problems that derive from the fact that big donors such as the Global Fund are either funding less or transitioning out of certain countries. And the presentations were clearly about sustainability and transition, while my presentation is not uh, specifically about sustainability and transitioning, and I work for the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. However, I think that the people who put this panel together, this abstract-driven panel together, uh, made a very smart decision because I would argue that uh, investing a lot more early on and not just in the years close to transition in programs to reduce human rights-related barriers to services is one of the prerequisites for sustainability and for successful transition. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, the research teams that did baseline assessments in 20 countries and my colleagues at the Global Fund. And I'd also like to acknowledge co-funding that we received from Open Society Foundations, the Ford Foundation and American Jewish World Services for baseline assessments that uh, were undertaken and that I will talk about. I'd like to dedicate this talk to uh, Jonathan Mann, um, in 1992, was my first AIDS conference here in Amsterdam. He was the chair of that conference, and he inspired me to do much of the work that I've been doing on HIV and human rights ever since. So the background, you're all very familiar with this background, uh, stigma and discrimination, gender inequality, and other human rights-related barriers continue to impede access to HIV services everywhere. And strangely, nowhere in no country worldwide have programs to reduce these barriers really been ever scaled up. What we see still is pilot projects, small projects in uh, one or two cities in a country, but never a comprehensive program to reduce human rights related barriers to services. And now the Global Fund is committed to trying to change this through an initiative in 20 countries that assesses human rights-related barriers to services in these countries and then supports countries to, uh, through funding and through the development of five-year plans to overcome those barriers in an evidence-based way. The 20 countries in this initiative are on this slide. 13 are on the African continent. We then also have Ukraine and Kyrgyzstan, Indonesia, Philippines, Nepal, Honduras, and Jamaica. In each of these countries, research teams assess existing barriers to HIV services. And they also go further because we already know quite a bit about human rights related barriers to services in these countries. But what we didn't have and what these research teams also did is they documented what programs already existed in those 20 countries to address human rights related barriers to services. And they looked at uh, available information about the effectiveness of those programs. Even more, we then went to assess what would be required over a five-year period to comprehensively address human rights-related barriers to services, to go from the small pilot programs that we currently have to a comprehensive national programs. And we also did retrospective costing of the existing programs. So how much money in 2016 was spent in these 20 countries on programs to reduce human rights related barriers to services and how much would it cost over a five year period to comprehensively address these barriers. 
The programs we looked at are the programs that UNAIDS defined many years ago, the seven key programs to reduce stigma and discrimination and increase access to justice. They go from stigma and discrimination reduction programs to programs with healthcare workers, with police, reducing discrimination against women in the context of HIV and TB, legal and rights literacy, legal services, and finally, advocacy and monitoring of uh, laws, policies, and regulations. We have technical guidance briefs on programs that are known to be effective at reducing human rights-related barriers, not only to HIV services, but also to TB services. Now, we first, we had to define what are comprehensive programs to reduce human rights-related barriers to services. And this is the definition that we came up with together with an expert committee of, uh, ex yeah, a committee of experts on monitoring and evaluation. So programs to remove human rights-related barriers to services are comprehensive when the right programs are implemented for the right people and the right combination at the right level of investment to remove human rights-related barriers and increase access to HIV and TB services. So it's country-specific, and it depends on what barriers exist in the country, which is what we assessed in this uh, research. In all 20 countries, uh, we found that human rights-related barriers to services continue to seriously impede access to HIV, and where we expanded that research to DB and malaria, also to TB and malaria services. We found a lot of evidence still on stigma and discrimination at healthcare settings and in the broader community. We heard yesterday, and thankfully at the opening ceremony, this received so much attention, the many issues of gender inequality that hinder access to services. And also we heard yesterday and we heard in our research the effects of punitive laws and policies, and particularly I would emphasize practices of policemen and healthcare workers that impede access to services. Now, as I said, few programs are being funded to address these barriers, and I'm only uh, giving an example here of stigma and discrimination in healthcare settings. So, as I said, all baseline assessments identify stigma and discrimination as a serious barrier. Uh, this is insidious, it in interferes with care, particularly for members of key populations. But in all countries, there's some effort in place, but usually this is sporadic and there's a lack of funding to take these programs to scale. And also, most often, these programs take the form of one-off capacity building and endeavors. Now, the comprehensive response that uh, we recommend in all 18 countries, and again, it's country-specific, so this is just a summary of uh, some of the key elements of what is a comprehensive response. Is it really requires institutionalizing training. It also requires uh, enhancing literacy, legal literacy of clients and enhancing access to legal services and redress mechanisms of clients. The failure to address these human rights-related barriers to services reduces uptake of services and reduces retention in services. And therefore, it reduces the impact of global fund and other investments. And I would add here, it also makes sustainability of programs nearly impossible. This is a graph that shows some of the gaps in funding between what is currently being invested in countries and programs to reduce human rights-related barriers to services and what would be required to really comprehensively address uh, these barriers. Um, they go from the small uh, circle is what countries are funding currently and the big one is what would be required. So a maximum of 55%, this is Kyrgyzstan, there's 55% of what is required is already funded, um, but uh, many countries are between 10 and 20% of the need, the funding need. This is one country example, and we have examples of all the countries in this cohort. Ukraine in 2016 spent about $1.15 million on interventions to reduce human rights-related barriers to services. Implementing a five-year strategic plan would require 
about 15 million, so about $3 million per year. And what you see in this graph is the seven key program areas and the current level and the required level of funding for each of these uh, program areas. So in, result, uh, in, in summary, in all countries, substantially larger investments in these programs are needed. The Global Fund investments are increasing, but they are not enough. Uh, this shows you the, I think, really substantial increase in investment in these 20 countries that are part of the cohort that will happen over the next three years. So the 14 first countries within those 20 country cohort that had their funding requests accepted, approved by the Global Fund, in the previous allocation period, in the previous period of three years, uh, only $6 million was allocated to programs to reduce human rights-related barriers to services. In the next allocation period, about $56 million will be allocated to these services. So it's, we're talking about a tenfold increase, which is really significant. And this money comes both because the Global Fund provided these countries some incentive funding that they could only use for these programs, but only use if they also provided funding from their own resources. And we saw countries accessing these funds and contributing from their own funds. Next steps, uh, we're holding multi-stakeholder consultations in all the countries. We already did so in Ukraine and Nepal. And we saw incredible engagement by communities, but also by other stakeholders, including other donors, including by the government. And we saw uh, national ownership of what is required, the de development of the five-year plan. These, we are being, we're developing with the countries uh, longer-term plans to scale up uh, these uh, programs to reduce human rights-related barriers. And we are also, and this is very important, uh, monitoring and evaluating this effort very rigorously. And we hope that this will not only sh provide us with evidence of how we can scale up programs to reduce human rights related barriers to services, but also the, of the impact that it, this has. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. And finally, Elena. Hi, my name is Yelena Shastina. I'm from Russia, and my English is not as good uh, as uh, work uh, what I do. Uh, because I will speak Russia, so you need uh, interpreter. Доклад, который сейчас я представлю, он не о переходе на государственное финансирование, но он о том, на каком этапе сейчас находится положение дел в Российской Федерации в отношении женщин, живущих с ВИЧ-инфекцией. Доклад мой называется «Родить и умереть. Что происходит с приверженностью к лечению женщин в России после рождения ребенка?» В России продолжается феминизация ВИЧ-инфекции. Около 40% всех ВИЧ-инфицированных составляют женщины. Женщины чаще всего узнают о своем ВИЧ-положительном статусе во время беременности. В России принят, не принят подход Би+, вопреки рекомендациям Всемирной организации здравоохранения. Несмотря на то, что лечение ВИЧ во время беременности более успешно, потому что женщины наблюдаются у врачей-гинекологов, нам неизвестно, что происходит с приверженностью к лечению после того, как они родили ребенка. И мы хотели увидеть это в нашем исследовании. Мы применяли смешанные методы, провели количественные и качественные исследования, в разработке анкеты участвовали сами ВИЧ-положительные женщины. На фотографии активистки из различных регионов Российской Федерации, ВИЧ-положительные мамы, которые изнутри знают потребность женщин с детьми. 
В пяти регионах Российской Федерации мы опросили 200 ВИЧ-положительных женщин, которые родили ребенка не больше, чем два года назад. Мы спрашивали у них о том, как они узнали свой ВИЧ-позитивный статус, где это было, кто им об этом рассказал, получили ли они поддержку, как давно живут они с ВИЧ, кто их поддерживает, испытывают ли они какие-то трудности в приеме препаратов. Что мы увидели? 36% женщин узнали о своем ВИЧ-положительном статусе во время беременности. То есть им сообщил об этом врач-гинеколог. И рядом не было специалиста, который мог оказать специализированную поддержку. Не было ни равного консультанта, ни психолога. Только 27% женщин из всех опрошенных получили ту самую поддержку. То есть они получили до тестовое консультирование. Они поняли, что с ними произошло, какой у них диагноз, какие их дальнейшие действия. Из тех женщин, которые не получили до тестовое консультирование и помощь специалиста, 80% имели нарушения в приеме лекарств. У них были пропуски более чем на один день. Они э, принимали лекарства неправильно, э, не по режиму, не то количество препаратов. То есть они не имели представления о том, как должно проходить у них лечение. Вы видите результаты, да, когда не было до тестового консультирования. Большинство женщин отметили, что испытывали побочные эффекты во время приема препаратов и имели тяжелые физические последствия для себя. И каждая четвертая женщина сказала, что она не получила поддержку специалистов, когда ей было плохо. Каждая третья женщина сказала о том, что доктор поменял ей лекарства выдал на менее короткий срок, изменил схему, изменил количество приемов препаратов. Все женщины сказали, что они принимают лекарства дважды в день и большое количество таблеток. Каждая третья женщина сказала, что имеет проблемы с финансами и порой у нее не хватает денег на приобретение самых необходимых вещей на приобретение продуктов питания и средств ухода за ребенка. Женщины не имеют доступ к социальным услугам. Из-за того, что в Российской Федерации плохо развита социальная среда для женщин с маленькими детьми, то эти женщины чаще бывают отрезаны от социальных услуг. Они не имеют свободного доступа в медицинские учреждения и даже в магазины общего пользования. В связи с этим это затрудняет их доступ к терапии, получению РВТ препаратов. Женщины, которые не имеют родственной поддержки или которые имеют партнера ВИЧ-отрицателя, они наиболее уязвимы к пропуску препаратов или к тому, чтобы остановить лечение. И наоборот, те женщины, которые сказали о том, что их родные знают о, об их статусе и их поддерживают, независимо от того, ВИЧ-положительный ее партнер или ВИЧ-отрицательный, именно у них была максимально хорошая приверженность. На этой фотографии женщина, у которой четверо детей, она одна без мужа, двое детей маленькие, вы видите, да? Это после интервью с ней выяснилось, что она связана по рукам и ногам таким количеством детей. Один ребенок у нее вич положительный, дочка у нее с туберкулезом. И она не то что себе, она даже детям своим не могла обеспечить лечение, потому что она выйти из дома и куда-то добраться не могла. Вот мы едем за тем, чтобы собрать документы на детское пособие, чтобы она оформила, хотя бы получала деньги от государства. Неожиданные результаты. Из-за того, что мы имели дело с мамами 
которых на руках были маленькие дети, то зачастую мы проводили интервью у них дома. Нас пускали домой, и мы видели их жизнь изнутри. И то, что обычно скрыто от посторонних глаз, мы увидели. И мы увидели, что женщины испытывают насилие и сексуальное, и физическое, и психологическое, и экономическое. Но они боятся об этом кому-либо рассказать, они боятся, что это обернется против них самих. Это стало неожиданным результатом и развернуло нас, нас как организацию, работающую с женщинами, развернуло нас лицом к этой проблеме. Какие выводы мы сделали? Российская Федерация – очень большая страна по территории. Мы проводили исследования в разных регионах, но не увидели территориальных различий. Потребности женщин в каждом уголке нашей большой страны одинаковые. О чем это говорит? Это говорит, что разработанные программы могут быть универсальные, вне зависимости от того, на севере или на юге живет женщина, какой она национальности. По большому счету, это хороший знак. Но важный момент был, что женщины не связывают лечение именно со своим здоровьем. Они принимают терапию только для того, чтобы у них родился здоровый ребенок. Вот на это нужно делать акцент. Нужно работать с женщинами, разъясняя им особенность АРВТ-терапии. Нужно э, работать э, в плане социальной поддержки, доступности социальной среды в нашей стране. И это уже задача государства, потому что это всеобъемлющая задача. А НКО, некоммерческая организация, может быть партнером, потому что мы лучше видим потребности женщин и сможем рассказать, как сделать для них лучше. И, конечно, в нашей стране до сих пор есть проблемы с обеспечением хорошими, качественными и в достаточном количестве препаратами. Это тоже имеет важную роль в приверженности женщин после лечения. Я вас благодарю и готова к вопросам. Спасибо. Great, thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, <clears throat> now with the remaining time, we have about sort of uh, 22, 23 minutes before the end of the session. Um, uh, I think um, across the presentations, we've had really interesting sort of snapshots of some of the range of different issues, both in low and lower middle income countries, as well as in transitioning upper middle income countries, um, uh, both in terms of some of the challenges, but also some of the solutions. We heard um, some of the impact of the um, concentration of donor funding, in, the, in this case uh, PEPFAR, um, in Uganda and Kenya, and the impact that that's had on, on outreach services and uh, reaching 90-90-90 in some places. Um, We've also heard from Ralph um, what are the, if, um, you know, the effective approaches and how to secure funding for the strong human rights uh, interventions in global fund-funded countries um, and how critical that is in terms of uh, to establish before we actually get to transition so that those services can be continued. Um, and then I think just from our last presenter, from Elena, um, you know, what happens perhaps when those services have not been put in place, um, uh, particularly human rights and gender uh, interventions and what some of the co negative consequences have been for, for women. Um, and then a couple of presentations that are highlighting both some of the advocacy arguments but also new approaches. Um, advocacy ar arguments from Ivan, uh, it would be great to hear from the audience, uh, perhaps some of your experiences and questions around that, um, but also in terms of new approaches. Um, in terms of securing uh, funding for uh, CBO and key population services, um, both in, in Thailand and in Ukraine. So with that, I want to open it out to questions from the audience. Um, uh, if you can come to one of the um, uh, microphones. Um, and what we'll do is um, I'll take perhaps uh, four questions to start and then um, go to our panel uh, and then take another four. So uh, questions, please.
Hi, Meg. Yes, please. Hi. Thanks very much. Thanks. Very rich um, series of papers. Thank you very much. Um, my question is going back to the first paper, which was uh, really important work, I think, from Makerere University. I was actually more of a question to Dr. Mugumbi, if you could share a bit, given the impact that we're seeing that uh, transition has already had in Kenya, and that Kenya is now a middle-income country and you know may eventually become ineligible, how does the Kenyan government now begin to prepare for the specter of transition in the future? Thank you. Great. Um, any more questions? Thank Please you. go ahead. Oh, thanks very much for the very interesting discussion. I have a question for my dear colleague, uh, Raf. Uh, um, so it's very encouraging to see how much Global Fund has, uh, you know, uh, almost uh, increased tenfold of investment in this area. Uh, I think that's a great uh, start. I'm wondering, um, first of all, how do we measure success when we put this money in and uh, down? And uh, what is the, our vision beyond five years? And uh, internationally, I understand the resource required to address the human, um, human rights barriers will differ very much depending on the situation by country. Are there any international guidance, advice in terms of how much of the HIV budget should be dedicated to this particular intervention areas? What is the current discussion? And where are we trying to get in a longer term? Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Hello, I'm Dominique Pato from Médecins du Monde, Vachimira, uh, France. And I have a question specifically to, to uh, Ms. Shastina. Uh, it's about, the, among the 200 women who were interviewed, how many of them were uh, using drugs or uh, opioid injecting, whether injecting or smoking or whatever uh, drug? Uh, was it actually uh, asked to them? And uh, if yes, if so, uh, how do you think it impacts the lack of linkage to care uh, for HIV after birth? Thank you. One more? Yeah. Shall I? Okay. Hi, my name's uh, Rebecca. I work for the Australian Federation of AIDS Organizations, and we're currently putting together the next multi-country grant for the South and East Asia region um, for eight different countries, and we are turning in the um, funding request next month, actually. But based on some of the experiences that have been shared, what kind of advice would you have for the next grants going forward? So you've told us your experience, and you have some general recommendations, but um, do you have anything in particular you would advise for those who are starting programs um, for transitioning now? Thank you. Was that a question for you? Okay, okay great. So, um, uh, well, just for, to start with the, the first question, uh, I think that was actually a question for you, our co-chair. So, so, do you want to start? Are you allowed to ask the session chair questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I will answer. Um, interesting findings from your presentation also about uh, my country and um, yes I do agree with the findings for us as a national government one of the agenda items for our current president is um, universal health coverage and so for us as we think about transitioning then it becomes an opportune time for us in the HIV sector to leverage on that and the key things that are in discussion is inclusion of HIV in our essential benefits package so that every person who's living with HIV has access to our national hospital insurance fund and can access uh, care and treatment services and prevention services. We're also reviewing our existing funding mechanisms and the review of available HIV funds. And there has been uh, ongoing discussions about having a HIV trust fund that is ongoing. And there's also the um, uh, leveraging on, on resources from the private sector to fund our universal health coverage and in turn fund our HIV programs. And then also learning from, from HIV and applying uh, the lessons and expertise from, from how the HIV program has been doing in general for our health um, programming. So those are the key things that we are working towards even as we think about transitioning from donor funding to fully government funded. 
Thanks, Celestine. So the next the next uh, question was for Ralph: uh, how to measure success and the vision for the next five years, as well as guidance on budgets uh, for uh, human rights interventions. <clears throat> so how do we measure success? A very important question and one that we've taken very seriously because one of the things that was uh, said before is that many of the human rights programs were only evaluated depending on the number of trainings, etc., that had been done, and we need to move far beyond that. So we've taken it very seriously. I won't steal the thunder from the presentation that my colleague Alexandrina Jovita is going to give in Hall 12 at the next session that starts at 4.30, in which he will talk exactly about this issue. I will only say that we uh, have uh, established both qualitative and quantitative indicators and ultimately uh, want to go as close as, as possible as showing that this indeed results in increased uptake and retention in services. Um, what, how much in terms of funding should be devoted to it? There's a figure that UNAIDS uh, came up with years ago, which is about a broader level of interventions for the enabling environment, and that was of 8%. I think we're going to, uh, through this work that we're currently doing and costing uh, what this would cost over five years in 20 countries, we're going to get a lot more information about what is required specifically for these seven uh, key programs to reduce stigma and discrimination and increase access to justice. And I also want to highlight that this is not the only initiative that the Global Fund is doing to increase investments in programs, but we also have a key performance indicator, which is um, about countries devoting 2.85% of their HIV allocation and 2% of their TB allocation to programs to reduce human rights-related barriers to services, which would be a fourfold increase for HIV and a vast increase for TB programs because in particularly in TB we've seen hardly any money in the past going to programs to reduce the human rights related barriers to TB services and we know how serious they are and we just were in a session where uh, people talked about uh, that. Uh, and what is the vision beyond the f next five years? Let me first say what we have already learned um, over the first year and a half as we started this initiative. So we need to do a lot more over the next years to further increase the capacity at the Global Fund Secretariat. Um, we are very clear in admitting that um, we need to do that because many people at the Global Fund themselves still don't really uh, fully understand the importance of these programs and are able to advocate for them at country level. So that's one thing that we are working on. The other one is that we're also realizing that at least in some of the countries, uh, some of the 20 countries, hardly any of these programs were implemented before. And that uh, civil society doesn't have the capacity to implement the programs, uh, the right programs at the with the at the right level for, at, with the right implementers. And so we're now developing a capac implementation capacity building uh, plan so that we can address that issue. We're also considering, and I think it's important to think about moving from incentives to, for a small number of countries to increase investments in programs to re, uh, reduce human rights related barriers to services to creating policy levers, strong policy levers, so that uh, we see investment in all countries. And ultimately, in the evaluation of uh, this in 20 countries, will show us what works and what doesn't work and what we need to change and we hope to be able to apply that then across the entire portfolio and not only in 20 countries. Thanks very much, Ralph. Um, Elena and I Ivan, I think um, maybe it was interested uh, to comment, but Elena? Is that Я благодарю вас за вопрос, он очень важный. Я представляю ассоциацию Ева которая объединяет специалистов и пациентов. И цель деятельности ассоциации – это помощь, защита прав женщин, живущих с ВИЧ. 
во всем их многообразии. Нас 69 членов из 29 регионов Российской Федерации. И Ассоциация ЕВА проводила исследования по доступу к медицинской помощи наркозависимых беременных женщин. И я смогу вам переслать эту презентацию и выводы, если вам интересно. Что касается этого исследования, то мы старались охватить женщин разных категорий. Но наркопотребительниц, которые об этом заявили открыто, было всего несколько человек. Да, они не продолжили прием терапии, но значимую связь именно с потреблением это не показало. Возможно, именно из-за их небольшого количества, количества женщин наркопотребительниц в этом исследовании. Они называли все-таки в первую очередь финансовые и социальные проблемы, все равно бытовые. Все равно это социальная среда. Они об этом говорили, что им нет возможности доехать до больницы, она далеко находится, у них нет денег на проезд. И это было вне зависимости, употребляет женщина или не употребляет наркотики. Называли одни и те же причины. Спасибо. Спасибо, I actually um, wanted to ask a question myself to, to Ralph um, on your presentation. Uh, I just wonder what was the approach to selection of those 20 countries to be covered by this initiative? And for example, is there any chance that other countries in the regions, at least like low-income countries, um, because in Eastern Europe, like you took Moldova and Kyrgyzstan, two of five low- and middle-income countries, so like... It, For example, Tajikistan, Moldova, and uh, mm, um, they also could benefit, like, from such an initiative. Is there any chance that they, this initiative could be expanded? And when, if? Okay, let's maybe just um, hold that question, if that's all right, and we'll just gather a few more. I think there was one last question that I didn't quite, um, quite capture. Yeah, hold hold on a second. I think there was one more question that was asked that I didn't catch who it was for, but. Um, is anybody? No. Okay. He wanted advice on, uh, on making another round for global fund advice yeah. on the making area. Okay, it was covered. Okay, we'll just gather a few more questions. So, yeah, the lady at uh, number four. No, you. No, no, no. They've both okay. been very Thank polite. You. Hi. Okay, great. Hello, my name is Georgi Soseli. I'm from Georgia. I present the Medicine du Monde to Doctors of the World. Um, I don't have the question. I more have the comment or reflection. Um, I would like to talk about the region of Eastern Europe and Central Asia because I represent that region. And uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's totally not understandable for us uh, considering that the Eastern Europe and Central Asia is the only region worldwide where we fail to stabilize the epidemics how the major donor is transitioning out from that region. However, if we live in the reality where the, we have to accept that, uh, let's do the real job. Because, for example, in Georgia, the Transition and Sustainability Plan was developed in 2016, and today, like almost two years later, it's not even approved by the government. So I would like to encourage the Global Fund to focus not only on the development and demand from the countries, not only development of the transition plans, however, their implementation and approval. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, do you want to? Sure. Um, well, good afternoon. My name is Octavia Lewis, trans activist from the United States. And my, I guess, question or concern would be, what is it that you all are doing in academia to make sure that you leverage the privilege that you have to empower the people that you are getting information from. Because oftentimes when people are, or oftentimes when we, people living with HIV, participate in studies, we are often left with nothing and let you academia have all of the information that you need from our communities and we are left with nothing. So again, I ask you, you talk about barriers. What about equity for our people? What about making sure that we are left with transferable skills so that after you have left us, we can go on and find ways in which we can sustain ourselves? Oftentimes, I don't think that is a question that is brought to the table or even a thought. And the 
mind of those that put together these RFPs for you all to apply for. But it would be nice sometimes to see our name as contributors to research. Again, that I think that would be the least that, again, you all in academia can do to make sure that you leverage the privilege that you have and to give equity back to those in which you've received information from. Okay, thank you. Um, let's take uh, one more and then we'll come back. Yep, the gentleman right, thank there. you. Yep. Uh, my name is Min. I'm the Shift uh, Financing Program as well, along with my colleague here in Asia Pacific. So my question is more directed to Global Fund and maybe to Ralph as well. Uh, in terms of human rights and the rights-based uh, response in the context of transitioning countries. So in the countries that we work in, obviously, there's, you know, key populations are the focus. But we also know that the domestic government is not that forefront, forthcoming to fund them in the interim if not for the next 10 years, while these countries are going to be transitioning in the next round. So my question is around this almost duty of care, if you may. Uh, what, what it means for communities who are you know, at the brunt of the, the epidemic, who are not going to have the resources to sustain themselves and the response that has been so forthcoming. Um, and what can, not just Global Fund, I guess, but collectively, what are the strategies that we can look into in this interim moment? Thank you. Thank you. Did you have a last? Yeah, do you want to just say? Yeah. Sorry, this question is for Ivan. Uh, I remember in your conclusion slides, you said you you said you've done a lot of work, including provided all the costs to the government. I'm wondering how does this cost look like, and have you to what extent you have made an investment case to the countries that it's a very worthwhile investment? I know, especially harm, harm reduction program tend to be more expensive to other interventions, it is actually a reaction for the entire society, not perhaps only falling under the HIV program, given the multiple benefits of this intervention. So broadly, how do you make an investment case and using those numbers convincing the policymakers for financing? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, what we can do, just uh, I think uh, we're coming almost coming to an end of the session, so I'll ask Maybe from the end, uh, if uh, all of our speakers want to make any final comments and ask uh, particularly Ralph, I think you had two questions there, if you can build those into your comments, um, and uh, Ivan, a specific comment for you, and all of you, um, specifically to our colleague uh, over here who was asking about, um, for, the, you know, for those of you who have um, uh, implemented research, how, how you've supported those that have actually provided you with information to do this research. So if that's okay, I'll maybe start at the end. Uh, uh, Elena, I don't know if you have uh, any final comments. Yeah. Я хочу поблагодарить за внимание к нашей сессии и сказать, что мы все работаем для людей, живущих с ВИЧ. И это, они всегда вокруг нас, и мы сами, это и есть они. И вопрос э, о том, где эти люди, э, которые, у которых собирается информация, ну вот же мы здесь, э, мы сами, мы сообщество, если я говорю о своем исследовании, то мы сообщество, которое проводит исследования внутри сообщества. И мы являемся по-английски, не знаю, можно будет привести, сарафанным радио. Сарафанное радио – это когда из уст в уста передается информация. И, конечно, у нас есть телекоммуникации, у нас есть сайты, мессенджеры. Мы обязательно распространяем результаты наших исследований. Самое главное – выводы и что мы с этим делаем, и какие программы на основе этого разрабатываем. Но про людей, живущих с ВИЧ, никто никогда не забывает, и мы с вами здесь тому свидетельство. Okay, thank you, Elena. Uh, Ralph, over to you. Yeah, I'll try to be quick, but there were quite an, a number of questions. How were the countries selected, Dennis? Uh, there was an extensive consultation process, including civil society, technical partners, Global Fund, and it came up with a list of 20 countries. Can others be added? Uh, if, if there's good advocacy with the Global Fund board, maybe, um, I would hope that other countries could benefit from uh, similar intensive efforts. Um, the friend from Georgia, I completely agree that there needs to be a lot more work done to ensure that governments also implement the transition plans and uh, yeah, 
this is uh, a big problem and we'll just have to do more and work harder to achieve that. I completely agree with meaningful involvement of communities, ensuring that communities themselves benefit from uh, the work done. Uh, I work for the Community Rights and Gender Department of the Global Fund, and one of our goals is also to uh, ensure that communities are always meaningfully involved and that they benefit from the work. So that has been the philosophy, f uh, at least for the work at the Global Fund. And ultimately, the question about the duty and care and what strategies we can look uh, at to ensure that programs that governments don't want to fund don't stop simply at the point when uh, the Global Fund and other donors leave, or what, we, what can we do to ensure that donors don't leave. Uh, for me, as the human rights advisor at the Global Fund, it's one of the most difficult issues, and I think it raises serious ethical and human rights issues. However, um, yes, I mean, the, the donors who give money to the Global Fund, uh, as you know, many of them simply don't uh, agree with that and uh, say that uh, in these countries um, it's the duty of the governments. I welcome further advocacy on that issue. Great, thanks for our remaining speakers. We're running out of time, so if you can, uh, maybe thirty seconds, that would be great. Rifa, uh, th thank you so much uh, for your important point. And I, I totally agree that oftentimes academia can become isolated from the very communities that we're claiming to serve. So. Uh, let me just state my full agreement with you that the more that we can have communities not just being research participants, but being the ones who are asking the research questions, the ones who are out there doing the s studies, the ones who are actually here giving the talks, the, the better we'll go towards not just fighting HIV, but advancing human rights. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks, Victor. Ivan. Uh, just responding to the question um, from from the uh, the lady, uh, like in the previous reincarnation of my organization, when we were called the Eurasian Harm Reduction Network, and we were implementing the original Global Fund grant uh, with a focus on uh, advocacy for sustainability of harm reduction services in the region. Uh, so the special methodology were developed and implemented in five countries to collect all data on like uh, finding and being available for harm reduction services and like uh, to evaluate the gaps and like to calculate the unit costs of like services and all this data is like available uh, for, for for these five countries and uh, were used for uh, the advocacy purposes but what we found out that like it's uh, much more easier to um, use not to use it but like it's much more easier being accepted when we are do the advocacy on the like mun local level level municipal level like to persuade the officials, but like it's uh, not easy. Like for example, for organization, uh, like um, for NGO, like to to to, to persuade uh, the government to, to use their um, uh, estimates, like uh, uh, on the country level. Yeah, running out of time. So just a few words for those who making plan of transition, and for Georgia and Gamarjabad. Uh, you're 100% right, we need to work together with authorities, not on the, only on the national level, but go to the city, go to the mayor, go to the deputies and work together, join our actions. Thank you. Okay, and the last one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think my, my activist friend from the United States, I think you're absolutely right, it's an ethical concern that should be shared by all academicians. Uh, what we have done, I don't, I don't claim to be a best practice, but what we have done so far is one is we have engaged the government with these results. We engaged the Minister of Health uh, during a dissemination workshop in Uganda after these results came out. And they're already suggesting ways of how they can replace a PEPFAR model. We are told they are going to talk about village health teams uh, to replace the, replace the community outreach arm. Number two, I wrote an article in the press talking about stockouts. And uh, it led to more stories from the national newspapers about stockouts. So I think there's a lot more we can do. And I absolutely agree with you that we're not doing enough. Thank you. So thank you very much. On behalf of my co-chair, Mike, thank you to a great panel and a very interactive and attentive audience, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.